all committed to disability inclusion. And uh, in that sense, we're really excited to hear from Fulbright what they are doing to make sure that um, there's accessibility when it comes to mobility of academics. And uh, Susanna, we're all very excited to hear from you, from Jeremy and the other speakers today. And thank you again. I really want to underscore this and send a big one. And thank you from the entire Zero Project team for what you're doing for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin, for the invitation. And thank you to all of the organizers um, of the Zero Conference for putting this event together um, and, and for having us. Um, this is a very important event and we're very excited and, and honored to be able to, to be here today and talk about our work. Um, so I'm here with my colleague, um, Jeremy gumbins Burling, and uh, my colleague, Kelly Swayze, is about to join us as well. And we will talk about accessibility and ICT in the context of our work at Fulbright. So let me say a few words about Fulbright, um, perhaps to offer a framework and, and context for um, this session. Um, the Fulbright program is a um, cultural and educational exchange program um, between the United States and over 160 countries worldwide. The program supports um, students, teaching assistants, and scholars in gaining international experience and promoting mutual understanding. The program was founded in 1946 by U.S. Senator J. William Fulbright, and it is considered to be one of the most widely recognized and most prestigious scholarships in the world. The promotion of diversity, equity, and inclusion has been a strategic focus of the Fulbright program for years, at least on the U.S. side, because um, conversations about diversity and inclusion have been omnipresent in the context of higher education for a long time in the U.S. But more recently, the Fulbright program uh, created diversity and inclusion positions in different regions of the world to support the promotion of uh, di diversity, equity, and inclusion through um, the building of capacity, through opening up spaces for conversation, conversations within Fulbright, um, but also conversations with external stakeholders and an interested public. Now, what we do um, at Fulbright is we, we ask our grantees to be cultural ambassadors of their home countries, um, to share about their cultural contexts and um, foster mutual understanding. We want our grantees and our program to reflect the diversity of the United States and of its partner countries. Um, but how do we facilitate access for diverse communities in the very different regions we work with? How do we remove um, structural barriers for minority and marginalized communities and um, for underrepresented individuals? Now, the three of us, um, Jeremy, Kelly, and I, we hold uh, the three diversity and inclusion positions that currently exist at Fulbright. And um, today, as I said, we want to share about our work and discuss approaches to accessibility in international mobility and cultural exchange. Um, so I would suggest that we all start by um, saying a few words about ourselves, about our backgrounds, um, how we came to our positions, um, talk about diversity and inclusion in the context of the countries we work with, um, and um, Obviously, so to, to give everyone um, in the audience a, a good idea of who is speaking to them, um, I would suggest that we also say a couple of words about how we are visually appearing on the screen right now. Um, so, Jeremy, if you want to start. Yeah, hi. Um, so, hi, everyone, and thank you, Susanna, for that, um, for that introduction. I just also want to give my appreciation uh, to the Zero Conference for welcoming us um, into this conversation, into this space this morning. Um, and I just, yeah, I'm going to just spend the next few moments sharing a bit more about myself, as well as also a bit of, um, as Susanna mentioned, how I came to this work. So, uh, quickly, my name is Jeremy, pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I'm currently uh, in New Jersey. Um, I am right now wearing a sort of blue shirt with a little bit of with a flower pattern on it. Um, I'm a white man with a beard and glasses um, with little white headphones in uh, to listen into this wonderful session. Um, and I'm in front of sort of a white background within a sort of maroon looking chair that you will see kind of throughout my talking a little bit. Um, and so in terms of me and how I've gotten into this work and my background, I think the way that I think about it is sort of, I'll, I'll share sort of two major experiences um, and do my best to keep it quick. Um, I first stayed abroad uh, when I was a sophomore in college in my second year. Um, I was at New York University and I stayed abroad in Prague. 
Um, and sort of there are two major things that happened there that kind of got me interested in international exchange. Uh, one was going abroad as, um, as I am, as a, as a queer man, and not necessarily having all the supports there to sort of support me in that experience. And so what it kind of um, showed me in many ways was how many experiences themselves, but particularly in this context of the abroad experience, had not, even at a university that had a very large thriving queer community, there was not as much thought or resources or structures to support queer students in going abroad. And I think for myself, that kind of sparked this thing of just, um, especially because I enjoyed being abroad so much, of I really wanted to be involved in that space. How could I contribute in any way to sort of create more context or conversation about how we support queer students? The second piece really, and this is a big piece of how I come to disability, diversity inclusion work, social justice work, is through my Jewish story. And I, I know I've shared with Suzanne and Kelly before of uh, being abroad and uh, having the possibility and the resources to travel to France to visit family of mine. And I bring that story up because much of my family, um, in my sort of Jewish story as well, um, really separated from Poland or what was po or, or certain parts of what was Poland, Lithuania, um, in, in sort of before the Holocaust occurred. And so when I was in France, it was the first time I connected with family where I saw my last name on an apartment door and sort of began a very emotional moment and for myself, going abroad allowed me to connect to people that I had never really met before, but immediately was welcomed as family. And so those were two powerful experiences that got me so excited to be part of international education work and international exchange work. What I began to realize as I started my career, and this is around the time I began working as a study abroad advisor at University of Maryland, um, was I was really drawn to the ideals of international education work. Um, thinking about how international education exchange could promote things such as um, world peace, how it could promote these cross-cultural interactions and connections, how it could really bring folks together to understand one another. And I think Fulbright thinks about that too with these sort of pillars of mutual understanding and cultural exchange. Um, but that, that those ideals were not always being able to be lived out, you know, noticing and realizing that folks, if they did not have certain levels of income, um, the fact that even thinking again about how folks with different marginalized communities were not, there were the communities and resources were not always there and the programs I was seeing at my institution other places. And so around that time, I started getting involved in a program called Intergroup Dialogue at University of Maryland, um, which is a pedagogy that focuses deeply on how we have conversations on areas such as, um, so areas of social identity, areas such as race, as gender, sexuality, um, in a way of thinking about them through a lens of power and a lens of systems. So how, the, how different systems and structures essentially impact how folks either benefit from different kinds of access in a, in a world and in our environment and, who, and those that are actually marginalized by those systems. And so for myself, that was helpful in both understanding personally many of the privileges I have experienced as a white U.S. man, able-bodied, cisgender, um, in the United States, and also eventually globally as well, too. And I think that systematic approach was so helpful in thinking back to international education. So what, what started becoming very clear to me were what were the policies and practices that were essentially limiting us from reaching sort of these ideals in international exchange, from ensuring that there was equal access, from ensuring that we actually, if we were promoting this idea of having true cultural and mutual understanding, what was sort of in the way. And so when I started my PhD work, that became a really large focus of, of mine, was thinking about how to sort of study this intersection of diversity, inclusion, and international education, that if we are going to promote these really wonderful ideas, how do we actually make them a reality? And that means having to do things differently and having to think more specifically about inclusion work. Um, and so when I think about some of the other areas as well about how I came to this position, it, it just sort of, I had worked in Fulbright actually part, as part of my career um, prior. And then when this position came up and was opened up, uh, it just kind of felt like a real dream. Um, I, my PhD work specifically has been working on a service learning program in the Dominican Republic and studying how students learn about social identity, social inequality and service. And so when the Fulbright opportunity to be um, the diversity inclusion coordinator for the Fulbright Americas program, the Western Hemisphere came up, I really jumped at that and was quite excited to see that as an opportunity. Um, so in terms of the work and where I'm based and everything, so as mentioned, I'm currently based in New Jersey. Um, ideally, I would be based, in, and the idea is that each of us who's a regional coordinator liaison is based in the region where we work. 
So hopefully in the future, I'll, I will be in Lima, Peru for this position. Um, but of course, with COVID and everything that's sort of going on, of course, in this world, that is right now on hold. The real beauty is having to get to work with folks like Suzanne and Kelly. We've been able to start so much work, and there's been a great deal of support to continue this work and to even just begin to um, build a lot of different types of initiatives as much as we can with the kind of current situation and status of the world as it is. When it comes to diversity inclusion within our region, within the Western Hemisphere, I mean, it's a very robust conversation. You know, there, there are deep shared histories across the Western Hemisphere through things such as colonization, through things such as slavery, which I think have deeply impacted a lot of certain social dynamics that um, shape a lot of what we see across the Western Hemisphere itself, sort of moving up till today when we think about different kinds of systems and structures, while also, of course, very specific contexts in which things operate. So, you know, thinking about um, sort of the predominantly white nations of, you know, on, you know, the United States and Canada, as well, you know, it also is well speaking about language as well, too. It's considering not just, of course, um, the Spanish-speaking Latin America, the Portuguese-speaking Brazil, the English-speaking Caribbean, and thinking kind of deeply about, again, how there are these shared histories, but also these very specific contexts. And when it comes to diversity inclusion work, you know, there, I think for myself in learning more about the region, you know, there's just a ro there's robust conversations happening sort of constantly about how, you know, from, very, from civil society organizations across the board that I've learned a lot about already in this work. And so when it comes to DNI and the program, um, I think what's really kind of going on right now is how we get these conversations to come together in many ways. So the fact is there are conversations happening across the board throughout Fulbright Partners. And I think what's sort of been really important is how we get those conversations to come together, to learn from one another and realize, A, the specific context in which everyone's operating, but also the sort of common challenges that we also are experiencing, what we can learn from one another. And so, you know, when I think about kind of the work itself going forward, I think kind of a lot about um, how we sort of begin to create that community. Uh, you know, even in a program as deeply connected as Fulbright, there's always the potential for becoming siloed um, and how we're having conversations. And so what a lot of the work I, I've been trying to do and, and also my colleagues have too, is trying to create these more region-wide conversations because I think it's the power of if we do this work together, there's a higher chance of us really formulating plans and strategies that will advance diversity and inclusion and especially for the conversation today um, around accessibility. And I think, you know, for myself, it's also been just learning more about how, you know, identity and how inclusion and ability spoken about in the region. So, the, you know, the term, for example, in Spanish is, es personas con discapacidad. And a lot of the models that I'm seeing and what I'm learning is really kind of that social model of disability, right? That folks are approaching the world with differences and it's the policies and practices in the world that are hindering access and therefore creating the disability. So I think that's also just something I wanted to name for the region is seeing in government documents, other places, conversations from civil society organizations that um, I think a growing really understanding of the social model of disability in a variety of languages and backgrounds. Um, so I will stop there and thank you for this moment just to share and ramble a little bit. So thank you, Susanna and Kelly, good to see you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And um, I will hand over the microphone to, to Kelly right away and ask you for your opening statement and um, you know if you could share about your region. Sure. Hi, I'm Kelly Swayze, and I'm calling in this evening from Denpasar, Indonesia. Um, so I am the uh, diversity and inclusion liaison for the East Asia and the Pacific, which is quite a um, broad and very diverse region um, spanning from all the way down to New Zealand up to Taiwan and China. Um, personally, uh, my background is in anthropology, and I have spent the last 10 years working in Indonesia um, basically focused on issues of diversity, but from a very Southeast Asian perspective. So um, I've been focused on representation of diversity in public, specifically in multicultural nations and post-colonial contexts. And I also do a bit of work with media. So I look at how representation and media interact when we're talking about things related to um, inclusion and access, and also about uh, tolerance and acceptance. So I've worked in designing programs and curricular, curriculum for higher ed across the region, um, sometimes in regional-wide programs that are trying to promote tolerance and acceptance across different communities, and sometimes for um, 
higher education exchange programs, both from the United States and Australia, bringing both students and faculty here to Southeast Asia to learn about the frames of diversity in this region. Um, and I also spent about the last 10 years working uh, at a university here called Gajamada University in a department that was specifically focused on public education and policy formation um, and also research that was going into the policies of diversity, tolerance, acceptance and justice here in Indonesia where we have, you know, a multiplicity of identities and a multicultural nation. Um, and I've also worked basically in efforts to make media with marginalized communities in Southeast Asia. And so that's made me very much aware of this issue that media can sometimes be a really wonderful platform for people to express themselves. At the same time, it can also be a tool of control and objectification. And so I'm very aware, I think, in my work when we're talking about anything to do with information and technology and communication, that there's both benefits and detriments to this. And I think that's part of what informs my work um, in a post-colonial context. Um, particularly as a white female in a post-colonial context with a PhD from an American university working in Southeast Asia, which is really part of my everyday um, practice of reflexivity is to think about what does that mean um, in terms of my positionality um, and what does that mean in terms of the communities that I work with, you know, what is my effect on that. Um, so that's really been part of what has kind of brought me to this position in Fulbright. Um, I think I came to this position in Fulbright partially because I am an alumni, and so I've been involved with the Fulbright Commission here in Indonesia on the Executive Education Committee for some time, and I've worked with a lot of young scholars um, who are hoping to go to the United States to study, and that's really informed my understanding of how contexts in the regions are variable, but there are issues that we see across the region in terms of access that I think I've learned about just as being a mentor for some of these students and helping them go through the process, and how there are some issues lost in translation between our American categories of diversity and then how diversity plays out in the context of the Asia Pacific. Um, so this has been, for me, an opportunity to give back to something, to an organization that really made a huge difference in my life as a first-generation college student in my family, um, being able to have a Fulbright-Hayes um, grant to do my doctoral dissertation research was something unimaginable for me as I was growing up because it wasn't part of my personal background. Um, and it's really, of course, changed my life and the trajectory of my career. And so being part of this and also going through the experience of being a grantee and seeing what was happening here in Indonesia and in the region and in ways that I felt that it could be more accepting, it could be more tolerant, it could be a bit better in terms of how we prepare and how we recruit um, students. And so that's really informed me coming into this position now in the Asia Pacific. Um, I think in terms of what's important here right now that I'm seeing in, in our region in terms of uh, issues of accessibility, issues of inclusion, is that there's a lot of intra-regional and intra-country discussions going on between activists that's really making a difference, I think, in what's happening in terms of the way people are communicating across different parts of Southeast Asia. and. Um, that has been very interesting because, again, that brings in a new sort of energy and a new sort of awareness to communities here about what the international rights are for certain groups. And at the same time, it runs up against this problem that I'm sure we'll talk about this evening, which is that just because the international category says this or the rights are framed in this particular way in an international sense doesn't mean that that always works or matches up with people's experiences in the regions. Um, so I think that's something that I'm, I'm quite sort of captured by at this moment and trying to think about how do we utilize the, this new conversation that's going on amongst activists and academics and people who are coming in through higher ed exchange and figure out a way to make that a more um, equitable sort of conversation and a more inclusive conversation. And um, I think for the future of our program, what I'm hoping to see for Fulbright and what I think we, the three of us are all working towards is that I really want to see Fulbright be a more active part of the vibrant civil societies that are growing across this region. It's such an important part of what's going on with post-colonial nations um, in terms of them coming to their awareness you know, of their role in the international field. Um, and I think it's an important part of us keeping our current scholarship and grant programs 
right up to date and aware of what's really going on and being as cutting edge as we possibly can be, we really have to be out there and be part of civil society to be able to do that. Thank you so much, Kelly. And um, I will spend the next couple of minutes talking a bit about myself. Um, I am a white woman. My name is Susanna, by the way. I'm my, I, I am a white woman. I have uh, dark hair, which is usually much shorter than it is right now, but I haven't had a haircut in five months, so, um, so you have to bear with me. Um, I'm wearing my glasses today, uh, which have a thick black frame, and I'm wearing a black blouse with um, small white dots. The background behind me is um, predominantly white, as I'm standing in front of a white wardrobe. Um, to my work, I am the Regional Diversity Coordinator for Fulbright in Europe and Eurasia, and I worked for Fulbright as a program officer before I assumed my current position. Um, but I also um, do have an academic background um, in the area of gender, sexuality and disability studies. I have a PhD in North American studies and sort of my main focus of interest has always been on the intersection of um, gender, sexuality and, and disability. And when my current position was created, um, it seemed like a perfect fit um, because it allowed me to combine my academic expertise with my experience of having worked on the program for a couple of years. Um, now, Europe and Eurasia is obviously a vast region, um, also an extremely diverse region, um, spanning from Iceland all the way to Russia. And uh, Europe and Eurasia obviously um, have a long and, and rich history, but um, also a history that's very um, turbulent, you might say, and, and rich in political conflict. And when you talk about diversity um, and inclusion issues in this region, I think you cannot look past these conflicts and past these um, turbulences because they still linger. They are part of this region's um, cultural memory and part of our collective consciousness. Um, obviously in the uh, 20th century, uh, World War II and its aftermath with the um, um, separation of Europe into East and West have shaped the continent um, quite significantly. And then with the fall of the um, Berlin Wall and um, later on the enlargement of the European Union to include post-communist countries, um, the separation into East and West was done away with on, on a political level, you might say, but um, obviously in, in the collective consciousness, um, it is still very much there and very much a factor, I would say. Um, in the context of diversity and inclusion, this is relevant because Western and uh, Central Europe often feel um, like they are more advanced when it comes to equal rights and the protection of minorities. And the former East is often considered as, um, let's say, um, backwardish. And um, in many countries in Eastern Europe, um, people also feel inferior to the West in this sense, so they have internalized this feeling of inferiority and of being 20 years behind the West um, in having these discourses um, on equal rights. But, um, you know, if we look at the situation in purely legal terms, then yes, in many uh, Western and Central European countries, it might be true that minorities um, have more protection than in Eastern European countries and, and large parts of Eurasia. But if we look at social acceptance, um, we still have a long way to go um, across the region. We see this in, in the context of discourses and, and um, surveys and studies that are being done um, on the um, social acceptance of um, LGBTQ um, communities. Um, we see that in the context of women's rights and obviously also in the context of um, discourses on migration and, um, and refugees. So in, in terms of um, disability and access issues, I want to say that um, from my observation awareness that um, these are things that are um, important to talk about that we need to address. Um, this, this awareness has only recently been, been growing. Um, disability has tended to be pretty much invisible from public discourse for quite a long time. And so there are many misconceptions out there about people with disabilities being passive receivers of care, not being able to participate in social life of disabled life um, as painful and tragic. And it's um, only been in recent years, um, I would say that there is a growing awareness of people with disabilities as active contributors to society and to public life. Um, because there, there is a growing awareness that disability in itself is incredibly diverse and that ableism is the problem and not disability. 
So it's the it's the barriers um, that are problematic, and it's not um, disability as such. Um, but I would I would still say that um, access issues um, were sort of pushed into the background, um, and other debates were sort of more prominently discussed publicly, uh, most prominently in the last five or six years, certainly um, migration and integration debates. And uh, that only due to COVID-19 and everyone's mobility being restricted and everyone experiencing social isolation and the stresses and anxieties that come with that and, and everyone needing to rely on technology to uh, keep in contact with the outside world, access issues have had a more prominent place in public discourse more recently, I would say, here in, here in this region. Um, and in my work at Fulbright, what is important to me is, um, so I, I try to not follow a deficit-oriented ab approach to disability, and I don't think of accessibility as something that should be need-based on an individual basis. Um, it should not be something that we only think about on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but I come to this work with the question of um, how can we create a program that is accessible for the marginalized within marginalized groups, for the underrepresented within underrepresented groups, and how can we make sure that our opportunities are available to all? So access um, to me is really um, basically the uh, the key to the opportunities that we provide, um, and should therefore be the basis of our work. And as I said, not something that um, we think of as as need based. Um, so I hope uh, moving forward, um, I hope that we will have made progress with applying um, principles of universal design to Fulbright so that accessibility will be fully integrated in all our processes. And perhaps one um, very concrete example I want to close with, which um, also relates to um, technology, is that I hope access to information about our program will be compliant with the standard web accessibility guidelines so that everyone will be able to navigate our websites, application platforms, and so on and so forth. And we will have created a level playing field when it comes sort of to the to the most basic thing that you really need in order to be able to apply for our opportunities. And that is, you know, get the information that you need. Right. So um, so that is my hope going forward that accessibility will be um, fully integrated and, and part and parcel of all our um, processes. Um, yeah, so much about ourselves. Um, we have about 20 to 25 um, minutes to um, discuss access issues in the context of our work more specifically now. And we've, we've all shared about um, the regions we work with, but I want to sort of zoom out again and look at um, the program globally and um, start um, with, with a fairly general question about what, what we think are the challenges and the opportunities of uh, working on diversity and inclusion issues in a program that operates globally. Um, and um, Kelly, I would like to call on you to um, share your thoughts on this. Sure, thanks, Susanna. I think I'll make two points. Um, one which I mentioned when I was introducing myself is that in a way the the, the challenge I find in this work um, is this idea the, that the understanding of contemporary categories of identity are contextual and they're historical to specific regions. And then we're working in this program that's global and of course has a very American bent to it because it is an American funded and run program even though we do work with binational commissions, so we have binational commissions in all of our regions, so the, the, the actual on-the-ground application of the programs are done between the governments of the countries in which Fulbright exists and also the Fulbright um, Management Board in DC. But, you know, this idea that the way in which we understand categories of diversity in the US are going to be translatable, um, they're going to be understandable, and that they're always going to be existent when people go to other places and other contexts. So that's one big challenge in just trying to, to deal with these, these very um, significant differences in the way that people understand diversity in all aspects of the program in the different places where we work. Um, and I think that 
the other challenge with that is that not assuming that the American management of categories of diversity is the only way or the right way to do things. And maybe this is the more pervasive or more important point. And that gets to my second point, which is that for me, decentering the narrative of American exceptionalism is, is both something positive that I think we are doing through Fulbright, but it's also very challenging. Because I think in higher educational exchange, especially to the global south, there is always this sort of, you know, sense of, oh, we are coming, you know, to empower people or to teach them about things. That's not, to me, a true exchange. To me, a true exchange is where both sides are exchanging information and learning rather than this one sort of way feeling of, oh, we're empowering someone. Because, of course, that is, you know, has inherent in it this idea that one side is, you know, higher in the hierarchy than the other side. Um, and so I think for me, those have been the two most challenging things as I've come into this position when we're talking about any kind of diversity. Um, you know, how do we communicate this both to our grantees, but also to our partners in the region? And how do we prepare our partners in the region to understand about American diversity, but also to help Americans who are coming to these regions understand about how diversity and difference and tolerance and acceptance and inclusion looks on the ground and, and how do we facilitate a, a healthy and I think a balanced conversation between those two uh, members of the program or two aspects of the program in order to make sure that we are being diverse and inclusive and equitable in all aspects of the life cycle of the program. Thank you, Anna. I think you've you've captured it perfectly. Um, the um, both the opportunities and the the challenges that we see in our day to day work, and obviously, I mean, we've said this in our introductory statements that the um, goal of our work is to make um, the program make Fulbright more accessible, more inclusive, um, and more diverse as well. But you know, when I think about um, what that means specifically, making the program more accessible and really pinpointing that, um, I think that's where it gets difficult as well, right? Because um, what does that even mean, making something more accessible, and particularly in a, in the program that operates globally? So, um, you know, does that mean the same in all of our regions? And um, I can say that, you know, for myself about my region, when I think of making the program more accessible, um, as I alluded to in, in my opening remarks, um, access to information, um, I think, is, is something that is key here in, in Europe, Eurasia, when we, when we talk about um, accessibility in, in the context of the Fulbright program, um, creating accessible platforms and, and websites. Um, but also, I think it's important to um, talk about accessible technology and access to technology in conjunction. Um, so, you know, I talk a lot to people who work in higher ed because I, I do have, you know, this academic background, so I have a lot of contacts who work at universities in Germany and in Austria. And, um, you know, th this past year during this pandemic, um, a lot of my friends who teach um, at the university level in countries like Germany, you know, rich countries um, here in Europe, tell me that, you know, their students um, attend lectures, remote lectures um, on their smartphones. Some don't even have smartphones, so they can, you know, attend those lectures remotely, um, you know, let alone laptops and, and all of that. So, you know, universities have um, um, digital learning platforms um, that they use um, during this time that um, universities are in a lockdown, but students can't even access those platforms because they don't have the devices to um, access them. So, you know, and, and these are things I think that, you know, we're only starting to to understand now during this pandemic that access to technology is not something that we can take for granted. Um, certainly not here in, in my region. So, you know, I was just wondering if there are um, examples that you might want to share about what, you know, creating an accessible program and, and um, promoting access would mean more specifically um, in your regions. I don't know, Jeremy, if you want to start. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think I just also like really want to center like what Kelly shared so much about just sort of um, really kind of harnessing the fact that, you know, diversity work without confronting power to me is not diversity work. And I think especially like operating, you know, for myself as a white man in the United States, I mean, especially when it comes to the region of the Western Hemisphere, the United States has had a in many places within this region, like also a harmful past. And I think so much of this work has been confronting that 
and talking more about that as well too um, in order to have these conversations. And when it comes to the conversation of accessibility, um, you know, I think in some of the work both um, that I, I've been sort of, because I, I want to name too, a lot of this for me has been also just more learning. Um, it, it's sort of similar issues that, that Susanna, for example, that you've named as well, that, you know, um, it's not just a matter of looking at how, if we're going to do any sort of work to provide particular levels of technology, especially, you know, we've moved so much to, especially a model, for example, in the realm of international exchange to doing virtual exchange programs, that it can't just be looking at, you know, how do we get devices into the hands of folks if we're not also thinking about this in a more intersectional basis as well, too, because I think what we're seeing is, of course, the folks who are having the least access to technology are also those that are being impacted by systems of economic oppression, by classism. I think there's also, for example, across the Western Hemisphere, um, issues regarding getting access to folks within Indigenous communities in particular, and I think that's sort of a theme that we can see across the region um, from the north to the south through you know from Canada to, to the to Argentina and and I think um, what sort of I, I kind of was looking up some different things too and was kind of an interesting thing about the accessibility question especially with indigenous communities that I was reading about was and, and kind of observing is this question of how it kind of creates both inclusion and exclusion at the same time because uh, many of these technologies are you know these technologies themselves are giving these communities access that had not been necessarily accessible before, both again, prior to the pandemic and now, because it's kind of part of breaching this sort of quote unquote digital divide, but that the technologies themselves are not owned by the indigenous communities themselves, right? They're being distributed by state mechanisms and they're not necessarily always part of that conversation when it comes to that work. And I, and I just want to bring that up because I think that's also a big question when it comes to accessibility throughout supporting marginalized communities, both in sort of kind of a, a singular categorical frame as well as intersectional frame of that who is owning or who is owning or who is kind of driving or centering the conversations and sort of distributing technology in that sort of way. Um, you know, and I think what something that's also kind of notable in the region, and this is also coming um, just also, I think, very much in the United States as well, too, is um, sharing technology is not creating also platforms to sort of educate and sort of empower folks around technology. So it's, I, I think I, we, I've seen examples of the idea of if we just give folks a laptop and some Wi-Fi, boom. And of course there needs to be so much more than that. There has to be systems and platform to create communities of knowledge and access as well too. And so sort of the assumption that, you know, all folks kind of share a common knowledge of, of how to use is also not necessarily always, uh, it's something we need to kind of, I think I, I'm seeing kind of need to be unpacked a bit more. Um, so I think I'm just going to stop there, but I, I think those are kind of just some of the points that come up for me in this question of accessibility um, immediately to that question. And I think uh, in particular for international exchange, um, that for us to, I think, have these sort of robust ability for folks to thrive on these sort of platforms, there needs to be more of these deeper conversations that really, not just, again, when I say center, I mean, it, it includes folks. Um, who are experiencing these, these different levels of systemic marginalization deep in the conversations around how to create a thriving accessibility platform rather than just sort of partially opening a, a, opening the door, for lack of a better uh, phrase. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, Kelly, is there anything you want to share? Yeah, I mean, just to add a bit, some examples, of course, this issue of differential access to technology is, is such a huge and important issue that's been really interestingly highlighted by COVID-19 and this shift to online education. Um, I think I'll speak for the context of Indonesia particularly, um, but this is for many parts of Southeast Asia. We have not only an urban rural divide, but there's also a center periphery divide between sort of the centralized, more populated um, islands in Indonesia, like Java and Bali versus what we call the outer islands, which are to the east. Um, and the infrastructure is completely different. The access to technology is very different in a lot of ways. You know, it's difficult to even get the physical presence of teachers in some of the schools in, in parts of the country that are not in the center. Um, so when we talk about access to higher education, we're not only talking about, you know, individual people trying to get access to technology, but we're talking about whole communities who may not have access to technology. Um, and furthermore, if we think about it, you know, in terms of language as well, this is something I hear a lot from people in Fulbright. 
um, people who are in the center have much more access to training in English than people on the periphery do. And so, you know, how do, how do they even get to the point? I mean, you know, if they have access to technology, which is not a given, um, if they have digital literacy to know how to fill out forms online, which is not a given, and they get to the point where they're going to interview for a scholarship, well, the level of English might be affected by where they're from, for instance, geographically in Indonesia. So we have to look, you know, across, you know, um, issues with identity, geography, center periphery relations, you know, all of these intersectional things that are overlapping when we talk about access. And then when you talk about marginalized communities, so people with disabilities, indigenous groups, um, people who in this country have minority religions, they are already dealing with all of this context and all of these challenges just to get up to sort of the bare minimum to be able to qualify for our grants and scholarships, you know, and that's notwithstanding all of the extra things that they probably have to deal with because of their positionality within the nation state or within their own communities. Um, so we've seen a lot of discussion about how great and how freeing it is to have technology, um, but at this, you know, or access to technology for education, but at the same time, um, a sort of lack of recognition that this has been a problem for a very long time um, and that technology is not going to be the magic bullet to solve all the problems to allow people to have equal access because it is dependent on so many other factors, whether people can actually utilize that technology or access that technology to get the information or to be able to participate in the way that they want. Yeah, thank you so much. So, you know, I, I think for me, the, the takeaway is that, you know, we for this session, we can look at um, international mobility and, and exchange um, through the lens of disability, but really we cannot um, discuss disability um, and, and access without acknowledging how complex um, social and political identities are and how they are affected um, by interlocking systems of power, right? Um, so, you know, I would with the next question, um, look more closely at um, access to international mobility and, and the use of ICTs, because that's something that, that both of you already um, touched on. Um, and, you know, I, I would like us to, to talk about how the use of ICTs um, can help us improve access to international mobility in Ful um, at Fulbright. Um, and um, how can we make sure um, at the same time that the eradication of barriers for some won't create new barriers um, for others. So how can we make sure that, you know, we're really creating this level playing field that I um, referenced earlier um, and that we don't create new um, systems of injustice or new barriers? Um, I don't know, um, Jeremy, if you want to um, start again. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, so I guess I guess one thing. This is me, uh, sort of name dropping, but really just because of a friend who I think has helped me a lot in learning more about just the the thinking about disability and accessibility. Is my friend, uh, her name's Dr. Stephanie Cork, and she's based at Ontario Tech in Ontario, Canada. Um, was when we started moving to Zoom amidst the pandemic, um, and she does, and so she does a lot of work on disability justice. Um, you know, uh, we were talking, and I was like, yes, of course. And you know, we, I was at University of Maryland at the time, and and everything, of course, is moving to Zoom. And she said very clearly, she's like, yeah, folks in the disability community, we've been talking about these technologies for a very long time and how we should have been using these in such a way from the get-go, right? And I think that this has always really sat with me, um, I think, because for a lot of folks, especially amidst the pandemic, um, it's sort of this conversation from an able-bodied perspective or an ableist perspective that this is novel versus uh, thinking more, I think, thinking more inclusively the fact that, no, 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 these are conversations that have been happening but have been pushed down for so long, um, you know, amongst communities of folks and scholars with disabilities talking about um, ICTs as a way to create more access. So I just want to sort of name that primarily to say that I think ICTs have great capacity and capability for us to create sort of networks and conversations. And I think, you know, I, I bring up the term again of a virtual exchange is that um, I think it demonstrates to us as well, too, because traditionally international exchange has been so founded on the, on, fa on folks having access to the resources to enter into physical mobility um, cross borders to be able to engage in sort of a broad experiences and often that in an international exchange modality that virtual modalities were sort of seen as a lesser model that if you were doing virtual exchange you were not getting the full experience of going abroad you're not getting the full experience of exchange and again 
this, these virtual exchanges have been happening pre-pandemic, but I think there's sort of now this new discourse again about how these, oh, we can do, we can have still robust experiences virtually if we sort of put our energies into this, where again, it's something that folks have been practicing, you know, pre-pandemic as well. Um, so it's just to say that I think ICTs do create very much um, a great level of access and also ensure that folks who may because of their own um, social positions and circumstances, whether that has to do with both finances, the need for working, um, familial commitments, whatever it may be, um, things related, of course, to, you know, to different forms of, of capacity and ability as well, too, to be part of this platform and to say that this can be it. What my concern comes from with this is really from sort of the impact of sort of capitalism within international education. And what I mean by that is, you know, this sort of real idea when it comes to how we work with um, international exchange as well is sort of what I would kind of call the capitalist trap of ICTs, that, oh, ICTs create a quote unquote more affordable or cheaper model for us to do exchange. And therefore the focus becomes more or less is how how essentially ICT technology allows exchange for us to basically continue profit bearing. And so what that is, is sort of a focus on, it's not what I, I guess I'm getting at is that if we do, if, if that continues to be a center, a, a center philosophy or a center model, then we're not actually centering folks who have been marginalized, underrepresented in sort of, in sort of virtual exchange and sort of ICT assisted international exchange. So I just want to name that because I think it's a tension that's very much there. And so what can become exclusion is that if that becomes sort of our primary focus, we're not, we're not creating and designing and centering programs built around the needs of the most marginalized as we're trying to think about inclusion within our various regional and country contexts and also through a global modality. Um, so again, I think there's very much a possibility if we continue to sort of um, center conversations and include and think more holistically about how we do that through ICTs to ensure that those are most marginalized of access. And I, I just kind of want to name what I'm sort of thinking about as sort of this kind of capitalist trap of, you know, ICD, ICT technology and virtual exchange is, quote unquote, the cheaper model with international exchange. Yeah, thank you. Um, Kelly. I think what I would add is something that actually came up in our panel um, that we had on COVID and marginalized community response um, from Dr. Sandeep Natwani, who we work with here in Jakarta. Um, one of the things that he was pointing out that's been happening throughout the pandemic is that the, the governments of some of the countries of, of the Asia Pacific have sort of said, well, look, you know, now we're launching all of these things online and everyone's so used to using things online. Now you don't need our help anymore. You can do this yourselves. And, and Sandeep referred to this as like shifting the burden of care. So you have communities that are already struggling for things like access and inclusion. And there's a sort of attitude that like now, now everyone's online and now it's so easy, which is an assumption, which of course is not true for everyone. Um, and that these communities then should just take on more of the responsibility of caring for themselves. So it becomes this way of sort of abdicating the responsibilities of the state. Um, and I think that was a really interesting conversation that we had about seeing how many communities that lack access and inclusion um, on a number of levels in terms of access to government resources and care. Um, now the assumption is, well, look, we've launched an online program and you seem to be using it, so you can use this for other things. Um, and not really paying attention to the fact that there's a systemic problem with the way these people are not included and don't have access. Um, so again, seeing technology as this magic bullet that's just going to solve all the problems without actually addressing the underlying systemic problems that are causing the lack of access and inclusion in the first place, I think it's kind of a slippery slope. And I also think that there's an assumption that, you know, everyone learns how to use online technology in the same way or that the learning curve is the same for everyone, which of course it isn't. Um, so if we talk about people with disabilities, if we talk about people who have, um, you know, not don't have access to the national language, for instance, there's a new, you know, number of ways in which people might not have the ability to come up to speed with the way that these programs are launched online. And where is the infrastructure or the inclusion to make sure that people have what they need to have that digital liter literacy and ability? Well, that often doesn't happen, especially in these situations where we're in sort of an emergency state. And, you know, the idea is, okay, well, we'll just all figure it out and get online and it's fairly easy anyway way. So there's really a lot of assumptions at play about how simple this all is. Again, I think going back to what we spoke about earlier, um, in a way that, again, can 
exclude people in another on another level, um, you know. And so I think we have to be really careful about thinking that technology and communication and digitization is a panacea for everything because it it certainly isn't. Yeah, absolutely. And there's maybe just two small points that I would like to add, or you know. Um, underlying points that, that you've already brought up and that is um, sort of on the one hand, um, as I already you know said before, I do think we need to think about access to technology and um, accessible technology always in, in conjunction. And I think we need to um, you know center our conversations um, more specifically on this intersection of disability and um, socioeconomic background, um, because I, I do think we we like to think of these two categories as um, you know two separate things. When you know very often we know that you know um, people with disabilities and um, people from um, socioeconomically um, underprivileged backgrounds. Um, face very similar structural barriers um, when it comes to particularly um, the use of technology, access to technology and access to information. Um, so I think that is something that we need to um, sort of focus on more, more specifically. Um, and then the, the other point I wanted to make was to, um, you know, um, something that, that Jeremy said about sort of how these platforms and tools are designed. Um, you know, I, I do think we've only seen or really started to understand um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic how, um, you know, a lot of these platforms and tools that we use for video calls, et cetera, are really um, ableist <laughs> and um, are using ableist design. Um, and, you know, when people talk about sort of intuitive uh, use and, and all of that stuff, then intuitive always means intuitive for non-disabled people. Um, and nobody seems to sort of think that you know intuitive handling of technology is not the same for everyone um, on this planet so you know i think these are, are conversations that are important to have what do we mean when we talk about um sort of intuitive interfaces and and all of that so um that is simply to the point that that you also made that you know just you know, having these tools out there does not necessarily mean that they automatically create sort of more equity and and um, greater access um, across the board. But we really need to sort of consider um, the um, the different experiences of of using technology um, for you know non disabled and and, and disabled people. Um, so I, I do think we're going to be um, sort of kicked out of this live stream in four minutes. So I want to close. Um, with um, you know a, a short question that sort of you know um, talks about perhaps the the takeaways also from from this session and from this conversation, and um, I'd like to ask you um, and myself um, sort of what what we can learn and and take away from um, looking at international mobility and cultural exchange through this particular lens of disability and access. So what, what are some of the questions that you know pop up when we look at our work through this lens? Um, and you know, and how do these questions sort of inform the way that we go about our work? And I would sort of again um, ask Jeremy to to start. Um. Wow, takeaways. Okay, I'll try and be quick. Um, well, you know, I, I think something the three of us have talked about in past conversations, and that I, I, I think I'm constantly just trying to like have to like remember just to keep refocusing is the importance of the intersectional lens, right? So, I mean, drawing you know drawing on the theory of intersectionality um, from like Black feminist scholar thought, like I think it's just so important in in this current moment that again, like I think a lot of what we've been talking about is like if we're not thinking intersectionally, then it, we we can't necessarily really do the work because it again it's addressing systemic inequities that impact folks in these sort of intersecting manners like you know Kelly thinking about what, what you know even just what you just shared too even about like that shift of burden of care in so many ways right I think it's I think that that my main sort of takeaway or offer is the need to sort of think about this and I, and I think also for us in our own regions to continue to look to different movements and social movements that are also doing a lot of that work as well too and providing platforms like i think really deeply about um for myself as a white man learning from the movement for black lives in this moment which is doing so much about thinking also like internationally and globally too about if we're going to approach problems and we're going to approach issues of accessibility that we do this in such a way that it tends to all these different that it tends to intersecting oppression and so i think i just want to offer that that i think 
thinking intersectionally is so important, especially in this modality of accessibility, because even just in what you named to Susanna about, again, like thinking about accessibility means we also must think about, um, we must think about class, we must think about economic oppression, we must think about resources. And I think also uh, for my region in particular too, I just want to name what Kelly brought up as well about language and how sort of this kind of reliance on English in particular really does create such a divide. Um, and so if we're thinking also in terms of accessibility, we are thinking about a multilingual, multi, I mean, a multi-plural sort of multilingual kind of atmosphere that has to be thought about more deeply. Um, Thank you so much, yeah, Kelly. Yeah, Jeremy, of course, I think for all of us, you know, using a framework of intersectionality is so key because we understand that all of these issues are intertwined. But I think that's also the point when we talk about something like people with disabilities and um, ICT, we realize that the issues that we're talking about here are not restricted just to the communities of people with disabilities, but these are things that are happening, um, you know, in terms of rights, in terms of recognition across all of our regions. And for me, this really brings home the larger point that both in Fulbright, but I think more generally in academia, if we do not start sort of bringing this into our work and addressing this as part of the theoretical work that we do, then we are really, we're really losing something essential to what it is that academics are supposed to do in society and what educational exchange is for. Um, it isn't just an abstract concept. You know, we need to be thinking about these things, not just when we have talks like this, but also within our own academic fields, within our own academic work, and making this really central to what we talk about in the modern world in terms of, of what we do as academics. Um, and I think it's so central that